Well, why don't you go ahead and take out your Bibles tonight, and we'll spend a few minutes in the Word this evening. Let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy tonight. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Based upon our conversation on Sunday and thinking about uh, the brevity of weeks that I'll be able to lead us in our prayer meetings, I, I wanted to return to some texts that I think would be helpful for us. Uh, passages, my prayer is, for my own heart and yours, would be instructive and give us guidance in these days in how we think. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, we'll look over the first 20 verses of this passage. I'll read it in a moment. But friends, I've often noted the fact as I've studied the Scriptures and as I've taught the Scriptures over the years that, that the trials and the difficulties that we face in this life are actually gifts of God's grace. They're graces from the hands of our merciful and loving Father. We don't typically think about trials that way. I think we think, typically think about trials as, as problems, as hindrances keeping me from where I want to be and what I want to have and what I want to do, as disappointments I anticipated and now I'm not getting or doing what I'd hoped by this point in this situation of my life. Tonight what I want to do is turn to this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 8, which I believe demonstrates the reality and the language that we find here that trials are graces. We could all go all over the scriptures to consider this. There are a number of passages, but this, this is one of the passages I have found especially instructive to my own heart on this subject. So tonight, let me just read down through those first 20 verses, and then we'll note a few things, just a handful of lessons we find in this text. So beginning at verse 1, let me read. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Paul's right there for a moment. Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. The people have now passed through the wilderness wanderings and they're about to go in. Moses can't go with them. Joshua is going to lead them into the land. And Moses is giving them at the end of 40 years the law once again to remind them what a blessed life in the promised land will actually look like. What will bring God's blessing in the promised land. And he says to them, listen to what I tell you and do what I say so that you may live and multiply. That's what verse 1 says, in the land. We just sang the final words of the last song, or the song we just sang last was, until I reach the promised land. It's picturing us as on the similar journey as these people were, wandering, waiting for what's been promised. And now they're about to enter, and Moses is giving them the law. Keep reading, verse 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, and of, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God 
by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your hearts be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as this, as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Friends, this passage, I believe, has in it instructions for our hearts. In fact, I might title this challenge very simply, The Benefits of Suffering. The benefits of suffering. Now, even as I say, even as I say that, the, the benefits of suffering, I think I'm very well aware of the fact that that probably sounds very foreign to your ears and mine. Because we have convinced ourselves in the way that we live our lives and the way that we, we navigate all of our situations that there aren't benefits to suffering. We just got to get through it, over it, past it, under it, around it, but we've just got to get by it so that we can keep living the life we want. Suffering isn't good. We think suffering is always bad. And yet we hear language in this text that I believe should instruct us. Can we face the fact that everything in our culture today seems dedicated to avoiding suffering at all costs? In fact, I would argue that we aren't just about avoiding suffering anymore. Now, the culture we live in is set on avoiding inconvenience altogether. Forget suffering. I'm ticked off if my fast food joint doesn't have my favorite burger. I won't be inconvenienced. I am the king and the God of my life and no one will disappoint me, right? Like, we live and think like this. Just watch our reactions when we get disappointed by something. We refuse to be disappointed and inconvenienced in this life. And I would just say, friends, that it's kind of a side note, but I think it's worth saying out loud that it saddens my heart more than I can measure to see an entire generation of people who refuse to be inconvenienced by anything. Don't make me uncomfortable. Don't expect me to give up my chair. Don't expect me to go without something I want. Don't take away anything that I like. No, I will not be disappointed. Friends, what happened to like Christ living a life that lays down my wants, my wishes, my rights, and my prerogatives for the good of others and ultimately the glory of God? I'll give my life away. Not demand you lay yours down for me. We live in a day when we expect that everything be ready made and instant and at my beck and call. And if it requires inconveniencing me, my answer is no. If it, conv- if it requires more for me than I normally give, My answer is no. If it requires me to go without something I want, my answer is no. Better have what I want. 
better not upset me. Friends, if we live like that, how in the world are we going to handle suffering when it comes? I mean, when there is real loss and real pain and real sorrow, I would submit to us that this is something we must get our minds wrapped around and our hearts surrendered to so that God might be glorified ultimately in our lives for as long as we live and throughout the rest of eternity. And I would submit to us the lessons here are are vital. So let me give you four thoughts from this text concerning suffering, how God uses suffering for the good of his saints. And the first thing I would say to you is this. I think it's right on its face in the first few verses that God uses suffering, number one, to humble us. To humble us. In verses 2 and 3, he said it twice, right? You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Now hear me, uh, you guys know this. If you look at a map on where they left Egypt when they crossed the Red Sea and where Israel was, a straight line should have just taken them probably a, a week maybe of journeying. God took them on the scenic route <laughs> 40 years to get there. Just circles and circles and circles in the desert. I mean, if ever there was a group of people who had the, had the right to sit in the back seat and say, are we there yet? It was these folks. And notice, they weren't just wandering because they got lost. It says, God has led you for 40 years. Circles in the dry desert without food and without the things that they would want. Why? Why did God do this for 40 years? His word on the matter, that he might humble you. And he humbled you. God uses suffering to humble us. Because whether we recognize it in ourselves or not, we are all prone to pride. I want what I want, when I want it, for as long as I want it, and no one better tell me no. And God uses suffering to humble us. But he doesn't just use suffering to humble us. Secondly, I would say this, that God uses suffering to expose what is truly in our hearts. God uses suffering to expose what is truly in our hearts. Look again at verse 2, and we're going to come to the end of the verse. What does it say there? And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. Have you ever noticed how difficulty brings out what's really on the inside of you? Our teacher Jim Berg used to refer to the trials of life as the hot water that you put a tea bag in. The trials don't put the tea in the tea bag, they just expose what's already there. The hot water just shows you what's already in the bag. That's what trials do. They expose what's already on the inside. Just put a little pressure on the life and listen to what comes out the mouth. And according to Jesus, that doesn't just like pop into your head in a moment. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Just put a little pressure. Listen to what you say. Just put a little heat. Just watch how you react. Just just withhold something you really want and watch the reaction and the response of your life, right? He said, I tested you. Because I wanted to expose what was really on the inside of you. And what you claimed. Oh, you all know how to swear by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Okay. Now, what's really 
inside you. He says, I put you through 40 years of testing to expose your heart. Just stop and think with me for a moment. Did God need to put his people through times of difficulty in order to know what was in their heart? Did God need to go through all this to figure out what was in them? You guys are shaking your heads the right way. No, no. This wasn't about God figuring out what was in hearts. He was showing them what was in their hearts. Because let's be honest, we are not naturally honest about what we really are. We are really good at covering up what's really on the inside. We, we know how to change the tone of voice depending on who walks in the room. We know how to guard our body language and our, our gestures. We, we know how to, how, to, how to change certain words. In fact, I'm, I'm astounded in, in my experience in secular workforces, especially when I get to in, in, into a work situation and guys figure out I'm a Christian. In fact, they find out not just a Christian, I'm a preacher. And I will listen to men from a distance, swear about every third word, and then I walk in, and guess what? I don't hear a swear word out of their mouth for 30 minutes. We all know how to put on a front, depending on who's around. God wasn't putting them on trial so he could figure out what was in them. God knew what was in them. God put them through trials so that they had to face themselves in the mirror and be honest about what was really inside them. He put them through trials of difficulty, times of difficulty, in order that they might come to realize what was really going on in their own hearts. You see, I think God wanted them to see what would come out of their hearts when, when, when life got hard. When they were hungry... Would they trust or would they grumble? Would they pray or would they complain? Would they rely on God to care for them? Would they rely on Him to supply their need? Or would they walk around kicking at the dirt going, I can't believe God brought us out to kill us out here. Hmm. He wanted them to see what would come out of their own hearts when life got difficult. And friends, I would argue that our God still exposes the hearts of his people like this. Not to him. He knows. But to us. What are we really like? Let God just turn up the dial of pressure. And we begin to find out. What are we really like? So God uses suffering to humble us. Secondly, God uses suffering to expose what is truly in our hearts. Number three, God uses suffering to teach us essential spiritual lessons. To teach us essential spiritual lessons. I I, I got a question. Would you agree with the statement that the word of God is necessary for true spiritual growth? Would you agree with that statement? Sure, it's on every good doctrinal statement, right? We believe the Word of God is absolutely vital. Do you read the Word of God like you should? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? In fact, if you can't get the Word, you are famished spiritually and you recognize it. Do you long to be with God's people and ache when you can't be? Do you pray and pray? Pray, as people who understand you are absolutely desperate for God and cannot do anything. In fact, you confess with the language of the Lord without me, Jesus said, you can do how much? Nothing. See, we know what's true. But have we learned it to the point it has changed us? I want you to notice the language of our text, because in verse 3, what do we read there? And he humbled you and let you hunger. Wait a second. That doesn't sound right. What kind of God lets his people go hungry? What kind of God lets his people not have what they want? 
A God who knows better than we do what we need. He humbled you and he let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Why did he do such a thing that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone? But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man doesn't live by food lion alone. Man doesn't live by Harris Teeter alone or Publix alone or Walmart alone. Man lives by the words of the living God. And he let your bellies get hungry and he fed you with food you complained about so you would learn something spiritual. It's not about the cuisine. It's not about the food you and I like. We are to be satisfied by our God, not by our groceries. But I have to ask, are we learning the lesson? He says, your clothing did not wear out. Your foot did not even swell. I'm not going to corner the cannons and ask if there was any ankle swelling from flights, but I'm telling you, after 12 to 17 hours on an airplane, I wear compression socks, guys, and I take those off at the end of a flight, my, my, my ankles just, they, that's 18 hours later. I can't imagine 40 years on my feet in the wilderness. Your clothes didn't wear out and your feet did not even swell. Know then, he says, in your heart what was going on. As a man disciplines or, or guides or nurtures his children, the Lord is doing the same for you. Wow. Did you ever consider the fact that going without something you want could be the nurturing hand of God? Going hungry, doing without, might be the active grace and teaching of God to shape you spiritually. Because that's what he says to his people. I actually led you in such a way that you went without that which you wanted so that you might actually attain that which you need. Wow. That's amazing. Know then that God is your Father. And He is giving you exactly what you need. God uses suffering to humble us, and He uses suffering to expose what's truly in our hearts, and He uses suffering. To, to teach us essential spiritual lessons. One more lesson from the text. God uses suffering to prepare us to remember him in times of great blessing. You, you think about the way we tend to pray, right? What we pray for is the blessing. Give me the blessing. Give me the money. Give me the wisdom. Give me the health. Guard me from trouble. I, I want the stuff. I want the blessings from the hand of God. I mean, that's how God's people pray. But have you ever considered that there's a downside to blessing? That you actually can receive all that stuff you want and forget God in the process. To get so comfortable with what he gives you, you forget how you got it. And he tells us in the text. I'm about to bless you in ways you cannot even imagine. And I'm letting you suffer now so that when you get what you have longed for and been promised, you won't forget God. 
Look at how he talks about it. Verse 7, he, he said it there. He says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. Wow. In which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full. You're going to forget you ever were hungry. And you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. We all look at that and go, yes, give me the blessing and I'll bless you, God. What is the very next phrase? Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God. And how often have you and I promised God, God, if you'll just give me this, I'll never miss another church service. <laughs> I'll never miss my devotions again. I'll never, I'll never withhold my tithe. I'll, I'll never fail to, to give you my life. I'll never fail to speak up about Jesus. I mean, how often have you and I in our heart of hearts, we've actually thought that if God would just give me, then I will live every day of the rest of my life fully for him. What does he say? Sure, we all think that when he blesses us to the full, that we will praise him to the full. And what does he say in the next phrase? Hey, be careful, be careful. Because when he makes you comfortable, you're prone to forget him. I'm prone to forget him. By not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which he has commanded us. Notice verse 12, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of a flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you and to do you good in the end. What does he say? You're going to forget all of this that he protected you and he kept you healthy and he guided your steps and he watched over your life and he supplied for you when there was no water and he gave you something to drink and he gave you bread when there was no food and this God took care of every need of yours and now you're living in houses you built and you're eating food that you planted and you raised up and, and wheat that you ground into flour and stuff that you made and you're living in the life that you want, that you always dreamed about. And conclude this. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. I went without, I ate ramen so I could get an education. I left home early when other kids were going home for Christmas break. I didn't get to go to Christmas break. Why? Because I wanted an education and I worked hard and I planned well and I got a degree and I started a job and I earned money and I built a house and I had kids and I took care of those kids and, and, and look at this life I built. I have everything I ever wanted and I'm taking all the credit for it. At least in my heart, if not with my words. I built this life. I accomplished my dreams. I've done what I always wanted to do. And where is God in that? Notice the language of warning Beware, because your heart and my heart are going to be tempted to go there. Our thoughts will drift there. Our hopes and our dreams and our plans and our imaginations. And we will conclude whether we ever intended to go there or not. This is my life, and I will do with it as I please. 
And so he commands. You shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth. You didn't go to work this morning in your own power. You didn't get out of bed this morning in your own strength. There is not one breath that entered your lungs today that was there because you're strong. Because you're healthy and because you eat carefully and because you made good plans and you exercise. You breathe because God puts air in your lungs. But we don't think like that. I'm careful. I'm wise. I'm cautious. I work hard. I plan well. I make my plan and I work my plan. He says, where do you think you get your strength? The strength to make your money only comes from God. The ability to have a job, the fact you have a career, the opportunities in your life did not come from you. They've come from God. Because God keeps his word. Because God makes promises to his people and then does what he promises. That's why you and I live. That's why you and I have what we need. Because God is God. Not because we're good at what we do. But because God always keeps his word. Friends, there's so much more we could say, and I won't take the time tonight to to chase more of it here. I, I, I just want us to think together, because I think we are tempted to think that when life gets hard, and when things take a sharp left turn I wasn't expecting, and, and, when, and when things I, I thought I could hold on to, I, I, I can't hold on to, they feel like they're disintegrating in my hand, like, 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 like sawdust in my hand I can't hold on to. I, I can't hang on to air or clouds or bubbles, and suddenly we realize life's like that. I think we're tempted to look at God and go, you messed up. This is bad somehow. This is wrong. This shouldn't go like this. May I remind us that trials are a gift of grace. Because God uses suffering To humble us. God uses suffering to expose what is truly in our hearts. God uses suffering to to teach us essential spiritual lessons. God uses suffering to prepare us to remember him in times of great blessing. Because if we are left to ourselves. We won't. We won't remember him. So God very kindly works into the plan of our lives, his sovereign work to remind us he's God, we're not. Now friends, I don't intend to suggest that difficult things aren't difficult. I'm not saying hard things aren't hard. I am saying difficult and hard things are good because they come from a sovereign God who knows better than we do what we need. And I might not ask for the hard thing. In fact, I know myself too well. I don't ask for the hard thing. You know what? I don't remember the last time I was asked what flavor of ice cream I wanted and I picked the one I didn't like. If I'm asked, I always pick the one I like. When people offer me something to eat, I I tell them what I like, right? When's the last time you picked the thing you didn't want? 
You chose pain instead of pleasure. Not because you're kind of weird and messed up in the head in some way. I, I mean, you, you, you intentionally chose the hard path. We, we don't tend to do without of our own volition. And so God often brings us to the place where we end up going without to remind us the sovereign knows better than we know what we need. So by God's grace, then I, I pray that we will learn that suffering and, and inconvenience are not, are not the times when God has forgotten us. I'm, I'm not going footprints in the sand, okay? That's not what I mean. I mean, genuinely, biblically, when, when we come to difficult times, those are not the times that God has forgotten us. They are the times when God is actively working to give you his grace. We saw it on Sunday as we thought about this at the end of our sermon. The Apostle Paul was about to become too lifted up in his heart because God had given him some visions. So God gave him a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of who? Satan! God gave him a messenger of Satan to beat him up so that he wouldn't become too proud and become useless to God. Do you think of messages of Satan and difficulties and disappointments as gifts of God because God actually knows what he's doing better than you and I know what we're doing? So he gives us the hard thing to make us like Jesus and to bring glory to his name and to accomplish the best thing in our life. Like we have got to get a hold of this. I have got to get a hold of this. Because I don't like the hard things. None of us like the hard things. So let's not forget, God hasn't forgotten us. No, those are the times that he is actively giving us grace. And may we also grow to cherish and to long for the grace of God more than we desire and we seek after ease and convenience. I was thinking about this Tonight, we were talking over at supper that there are points in our lives, and we've recently come into one, where you start to reach the edge of whatever resources and reserves you think you have. And we're kind of hitting a point where I'm starting to reach the limits of my sanity because there's just so many things pressing in and pulling. I told Christy, I feel like I'm caught in the middle of four different worlds that have a gravitational pull, and any minute I could get pulled apart by them. I don't say that because I want sympathy. I say that to say, folks, I, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I do know what it feels like to come to the end of yourself and to think this is a terrible situation and to have to realize, no, God is actually shaping me right now. And it's hard. And it hurts. And to be honest, I didn't ask for it. <laughs> But my father knows better than I do what I need. And your father knows better than you do what you need. So I have to ask. Are we thinking right about difficulty? I pray that our hearts will be informed by the word. And our thinking will be shaped by truth. And our hearts and minds and lives will be submitted to the sovereign. Father, do with us as you will. What are we saying? Sever any tie. Save the tie that binds me to your heart. Do we mean that? Or do we only sing it? And then hope he didn't hear that prayer in song. See, we know how to pray it. I'm praying we will learn how to live it. 
to that end. We want to pray tonight.